Fire Slayer CCG was a collectible card game created by Score Entertainment that premiered in 2001. As the name gives away, it is based on the hit television series that ran from 1997 to 2003. The card game produced three expansion sets, Peregrine Prophecy, Angel's Curse, and Class of 99, each mostly being based on the first three seasons of the show. There were two sets planned for Season 4, called Slayer on Campus and Initiative, but the card game was discontinued before they could be released. While this game was short-lived, it had a very interesting engine that I think is very underappreciated. Today I'm going to give a brief overview of the game, my personal experience with the game, and what I think could have been. Each player brings with them a 60-card resource deck, a 7-card challenge deck, 0-8 to eight locations, and most importantly, an essence card. An essence re represents a main character as the leader of your deck, along with a level 1 matching character card. Your level 1 main character dictates the alignment of your deck, meaning if you're playing a hero main character like Buffy, all of your characters have to be heroes or companions, while a villain would only have villains and minions in their deck. Heroes and companions face good challenges, and villains and minions face evil challenges. You may only have a total of 5 heroes or villains in play, meaning 1 main character and 4 supporting characters. There are also level 2 and level 3 character cards that you can ascend a character by placing the ascension on top of the matching character, similar to how Pokemon evolve in the Pokemon TCG. You can only ascend a character if you meet the amount of destiny points stated on the card. Among the heroes and villains in your resource deck, you'll find item skills, events, episodes, and action cards. Turns are shared with each player, with one player having the initiative where they perform actions during stages and phases first. Characters and challenges are played onto locations and your characters can move to adjacent locations. At the end of each turn, a special marker changes from night to day or day to night. The biggest impact of this mechanic is that vampires move two times during the night, but cannot move during day turns. Players compete in challenges and fights to earn destiny points, and once you've reached 10 destiny points, you win the game. Another way to win the game is achieving something called Park Victory. In the middle of the map is Sunnydale Park, and if you are the only one to control characters at Sunnydale Park, at the end of each turn, you control the park. If you control the park six turns in a row, you win the game. What makes the game unique is how the characters compete in challenges and fights. While most card games are able to handle combat in a flavorful way, the game offers something different with a variety of different challenges. Each character has four talents. Butt kicking, smarts, weirdness, and charm. Characters can use their charm to join the cheerleading squad, weirdness to cast spells, and smarts to scour the internet for information on the big bad. Butt kicking can be used in challenges but is the default talent for fights. During fights and challenges, the active player and the defending player create talent stacks. During challenges, players take turns adding actions, skills, and items to talent stacks. During challenges, you add your character's talents participating in the challenge to the talents in the talent stack, and comparing those to the challenge they are facing. The defending player adds their talent stack to the challenge to make them more difficult. Fights are pretty similar with two characters competing with their butt-kicking talent. When you win a challenge, you gain destiny points equal to what's listed on the challenge, and for fights, the winning player gains one destiny point and the losing character is discarded. In the class of 99, the essence cards found in the starter decks were double-sided. Each essence card on one side had a character prominent in Season 3. Buffy, Xander, Willow, Angel, Faith, the Mayor, Mr. Trick, and Kid Kistos. The other side each had a, a character important to Season 4. Riley, Anya, Tara, Spike, Adam, Maggie Walsh, Harmony, and Kathy. Class of 99 also had a card called Board Now, which was a Vampire of Willow and Dark Willow only card. Only cards being exclusive cards that could only be included in decks with matching essence cards. 
Score's intention was to release the matching level 1s and, in Dark Willow's case, an Essence card and matching level 1 in the would-be Season 4 sets and an eventual Season 6 set. With the axe being brought down on the game before these sets could be released, Score decided as a last send-off to the game to release a series of virtual cards to complement these broken links. Included in these virtual cards were the missing level 1s for these essences, as well as an essence for Dark Willow. Included in the set of cards were a few college and initiative locations, level 1 cards for Dawn, Glory, The Gentleman, and Joyce, an episode card for Once More With Feeling, an event called The End, and an action called Proactive With Pep. These were given out as a PDF for players to print and play with. This wasn't the only time that they gave out cards in this fashion, as they would frequently give out Hero and Villain of the Week cards, usually essences for side characters like Darla and Jenny Calendar. After the game was discontinued, the game lived on for a few more years thanks to a player community known as the Watchers Council Association, who organized tournament play and more importantly, they judged and released dream cards. Dream cards were created through weekly contests, and the first round of dream cards were to complete the broken links. Following the dream cards to round out the broken link cards, the contest continued with characters that would be prominent in later seasons, like pot the Potentials, Robin Wood, and the First. After that, the weekly contest focused on specific episodes. This is where I truly came into the picture. I participated in these contests almost every week, starting around the end of Season 4. My cards did get chosen often, but as I scoured the Wayback Machine to look at my entries, I found that I created a lot of overly complicated cards for these contests. These cards were allowed at competitions, usually held at Gen Con, but I never really got a chance to play with them at competitions because I only played the game casually. The Dream Card community continued by finishing Seasons 4 through 7, in which all of the featured cards can be found on the website through the Wayback Machine. After the completion of the series, the community did contests for seasons 1 through 3, I think mostly to up the power level of cards for these seasons, and I will get to that point in a minute. Work began on Buffy's sister show, Angel, and the main characters and essences had contests completed, as well as episodes up to season 2. Eventually, though, each of us in the community began to drift apart, and whoever was paying for hosting the website and forum also saw the writing on the wall, and now only way to access the site is through the Wayback Machine. Most of the cards from Seasons 1-3 through 3 and the Angel cards never made it into the card form, only existing as text in these contests. I have been seeing praise for this game, but I wanted to take a moment to discuss the good and the bad of the design of it. What I loved most about the game is the tactileness and storytellingness of the game. It feels like a mashup between an RPG and a card game. Most card games don't really emulate things outside of combat, and their engines generally have a hard time handling things like puzzles and skill checks. If you look at the two Dungeons & Dragons sets from Magic the Gathering, the closest the game came to expressing this was Dungeons, but everything else was more or less par for the course for Magic. You could venture into Dungeons, but it's very surface level. That being said, I absolutely love this mechanic and have a Nadar Commander deck that I love playing. The tactile moving around the map isn't as unique, but it's still really fun. The Star Wars CCG by Decipher from the early 90s had a pretty similar location and movement system, but I feel Buffy had a bit more manageable of a system as you couldn't have more than 8 locations, while I feel the Star Wars map could grow out of control. Something that works in favor and against the Buffy CCG is its dedication to flavor over function. While the system isn't necessarily tied to the IP, the cards feel very Buffy flavored, but in some ways it can shoot the game in the foot. One example of this is the characterization of Drusilla. Her character cards all care about filtering and drawing cards, while her essence gives her a boost to all of her talents if Spike is in play. While this is flavorful, I wouldn't say it's the most optimized version we could have gotten for her essence card. The stat boost is nice if you're using Drusilla for challenges, 
but it doesn't really help if your game plan is to filter through your deck as fatigue characters can't participate in challenges or fights and even get a minus one debuff to all their stats when they are fatigued. You would have also had to have bought multiple starter decks in order to get multiple spikes as he only appeared as a level one in randomized starter decks in Paragon Prophecy and as a rare in Class of 99 boosters. The biggest problem I've come across while testing decks against each other is power creep. Many of the characters from Paragon Prophecy aren't very good compared to their Class of 99 counterparts. Buffy from Prophecy needs to face a main character in order to get the same base stat total as her Class of 99 counterpart, and that's her only ability. I also found the power discrepancy was beyond just talent totals. Angelus has a really good stat total across the board, and I thought maybe he'd make a good challenge deck. I pitted him against a Faith deck, and I think it kind of showcased my point. Faith is actually very well designed. She's meant to move around the board and slay vampires, and her essence helps with that. It may not seem like a lot, but two additional cards over your opponent each turn is extremely significant, and Angelus was continually losing to her, and even with his ability to move twice at night, he was just running from her. Now this could have been just me not creating the best optimized deck because my card pool is limited, but it does seem a little lopsided. Flavor Overload and Power Creep wasn't a stranger to the Virtual or Dream cards either. Most of the level 1s from the Broken Link Virtual cards had incredibly high base talent totals, often having totals equal to that of level 2 and 3s from the Class of 99 set. The Dream Card community had made level 2 and 3 cards for Dark Will that ended up getting banned in the Dream Card format. I know that I have designed cards for the contest mostly with flavor in mind, so I can't really say that I'm not at fault. One last criticism I'd have with the game is that while there was power creep as the game moved on, there wasn't exactly a lot of complexity. The game introduced events in Angel's Curse and episodes in Class of 99. But if I'm honest, I don't think either did anything that revolutionized the game. I think if they introduced things like keywords, each set would have felt mechanically different and would make the game feel fresher from set to set. I think what could have made the game last longer is if it wasn't exactly tied just to Buffy. Imagine if Score had gotten multiple IPs that would fit in the narrative nature of the game. At the time when the game was active, Charmed was still running, Smallville was still running, X-Files was still running, two behemoth shows that were also on the horizon were lost in Supernatural that if the game had lasted, they could have adopted these properties as well. The major show that kind of motivated me to talk about this game was Stranger Things. The entire time I was watching Season 4, something just reminded me about the game. I think as a show it kind of encompasses what the game conveys pretty well. There's a lot of investigating, there's a lot of moving from locations to location, there are both physical fights and psychic fights that can be represented well within this game. Stranger Things has already dipped into the realms of card games with the Magic the Gathering secret lair. I do plan on making a deck with these cards eventually. But I do think that the show can be more easily conveyed with this game engine than it could be with the Magic game engine. There's also been a lot of shows in the past, like a lot of the Arrowverse shows and Once Upon a Time could have worked really well with this game engine as well. And it would have just been neat if it could kind of encompass like multiple IPs instead of just being solely on Buffy. The card game verse system has probably been the only one who's tried to handle like multiple IPs. Well, and now Magic the Gathering with the universes beyond, but most of the time, most card games just focus on one IP. And I think this could have been an opportunity to incorporate a lot of different IPs, and they would all kind of fit and play well together. It'd be kind of like writing a fan fiction where these sh all these shows just kind of crossed over. And I think it would have been really fun to have that in real life if that was could have been possible. Tell me what you guys think of the Buffy CCG. Is it a game that you've played in the past? Is it something that 
you could feel could have been introduced to other IPs like Stranger Things or Once Upon a Time. Um, tell me if there's a card game that you've played where you felt like it kind of captured other shows or other IPs that could have fit well with it. Um, if you really, I'd really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to my channel. And if you could leave some comments, that'd be great. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you guys later. Thank you. Bye-bye.